So what we're going to do is we're here to expose it, let people tell their story, and let them, let everybody in the public see the horrors of the court system in Suffolk County, New York. Uh, our next guest is Marty Tank. We're trying to get Marty to speak for a while because we know that he's an advocate. And like Jeff, he's trying to change the world and make the world a better place. But he's been busy uh, with law school and he just took the bar. So this is about, about a week ago that he took it. So we're really appreciative that he's taking his time to come out and spend the evening with us. Um, Marty was convicted of killing his parents in June uh, of 1990 and was sentenced to two consecutive terms of 25 years to life in prison. A 2003 appeal presented new evidence from 20 witnesses and an appellate court ultimately overturned his conviction after Marty served 17 years in prison. The incident and subsequent trials were the subject of a criminal injustice, a true crime and false confession, and the fight to free Marty Tanklish, uh, which is a published uh, book in 2008. On January of 2014, uh, Marty got a financial award uh, after settling for his wrongful conviction lawsuit. Marty graduated from law school at Toro Law Center in 2014 and just recently took the uh, New York State Bar exam and we all wish him uh, good luck in that, but we know he's going to do it and he's going to be a great attorney. So I don't want to take up much of uh, Marty's time because like our other two guests, condensing this into a half hour is very is very difficult to do. So welcome uh, welcome to the show, Mark, to the show. Yeah, I'm not doing my show. This is a, this is a lecture. <laughs> Sure. I'm, I'm not a fan of mics because I like to walk around. Uh, but let me just touch on one thing Gary said. Uh, most locations where I've ever spoken, I get very little feedback questioning my innocence or guilt. I can tell you, though, that there was one occasion where my lovely wife, Lori, was there. I think you were there at that one. Master, I spoke at Nassau Community College. And at the very end, I usually do a Q&A. And I actually really encourage Q&A because I find it brings out the best in people and sometimes the worst in people because it shows how uneducated individuals can be. So there's an individual who came up and he said, you know, Mr. Tankle, I think you're guilty. So I'm used to that. So I said, sir, why? Well, Tom Smota said so. <laughs> so as you can imagine, you know, if anybody's been to National Community College, it's a room full of hundreds of people. Uh, and, you know, most of them were there to hear me speak with my supporters, and there was a little bit of an uproar, and I said, relax, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's okay. So I just said to him, I said, so why? Well, Tom Spoda said so. I said, are you telling me you're basing your entire opinion about my guilt or innocence because the Suffolk County District Attorney said so? He goes, said yes. I said, well, do me a favor. I said, let's reevaluate this. I said, there's this book, A Criminal Injustice, and I actually had a copy with me. I said, do me a favor. I said, take the book home with you, read it. If you have the exact same position that you do, contact me. I'll give you my phone number, my cell phone, my email. Let's talk about it. Obviously, I've never heard from him. Okay? And that's because, very simply, Anyone who looks into the facts of my case, not a media hype, which existed back in 1988 and 1989 and 1990, the facts, okay? And I don't like to talk about the case that much because it's kind of been expounded on in the media time and time again, but I'm gonna give you kind of an abbreviated version. My father was partner with Jerry Stewerman, who owned a bagel store. My father loaned him a large amount of money. Jerry Stewerman's son, Todd Stewerman, was a drug dealer on Long Island. We believe in the summer of 1988, my father came to realize what the business was about, demanded to get out. That summer, Jerry Stewerman threatened to cut my father's tongue out, uh, and there were some other threats that existed. On September 7th, my father held a high stakes poker game at the house, which was common. My father was in a regular poker group, and one of the members happened to be Jerry Stewerman because my father was this guy who grew up in Brooklyn. Nothing was going to stop him. Nothing was going to intimidate him. And as the evidence came out, we learned that Jerry Stewerman wasn't the last one to leave, which he should have. But at that point, my father had already started to call in money. 
I wake up the next morning, discover my father had been attacked. I called 911, follow the 911 operator, and then what I would call kind of the roller coaster ride of turmoil erupted. Uh, I was brought into custody, I was interrogated, and what's very interesting about Suffolk County, which most people don't know, is that they have had on the books a policy procedure for interviews and interrogations, especially in homicide investigations, from way back when. They chose not to do it. So when my case came to trial, it wasn't let's play the videotape or let's play the audio tape. It was a he said, she said game. It was a conscious decision they made not to record the interrogation. And I can remember I was at an event where someone raised the issue of, well, it costs too much to record interrogations. Uh, this was a few years ago, and I kind of looked at the individual who was in law enforcement. I said, really? I said, how many hours can I record on this? I said, so are you trying to tell me the low cost of recording an interview interrogation is more valuable than 17 and a half years of my life? I mean, I'm sure Jeff and I can both attest that if our interrogations were recorded, audio tape, video tape, which is the best, every individual could observe what took place in that room. Uh, you can go online because some people say, well, come on, what, what really goes on in interrogation rooms? Go online and watch the Michael Crow interrogation to get an idea of what law enforcement does in interrogations of youthful suspects. Lying to them, deceiving to them, physical abuse, verbal abuse. Uh, just tell us what we want to hear and you can go home. And the sad thing about this is most people think I would never confess to a crime I didn't do. So when I hear that, I've learned that you kind of have to break it down in the most simple form. How many people in this room have siblings? How many people remember when you were kids and you and your siblings were home alone and your parents went out and let's say a lamp broke and your parents came home and said, until we find out who broke the lamp, we're not going out for ice cream. It's as simple as that. And how many of you who didn't break the lamp said, okay, I broke the lamp, let's go. You've just confessed. You know, and when people understand, it really is that simple, okay? To understand, that's a confession. You've just lost, you know, you just admitted something. Now magnify what I would say a million times, a trillion times beyond that, where you're held into an interrogation room. It's not an interview room, no matter what law enforcement wants to say, okay? They don't have interview rooms that have no windows, no working telephones, closed doors, soundproof. They don't have that. Those are interrogation rooms. So I was eventually charged with the murder of my parents, and we ended up having 12 weeks of trial. Um, but just so you understand how, what I would say is inept, and how deceitful and dishonest law enforcement can be, if I told you that there was an individual who owed my father half a million dollars, he cleaned out a joint bank account within 24 hours, he changed his appearance, he told his family he'd be swimming with the fish, he faked his own death, he had five aliases, he fled the jurisdiction going from New York to New Jersey up to California. He had a hair weave and he belonged to a club. And when he was in California, he went to not his club, some other place, paid in cash, got his hair done, and was found hiding in a psychiatric retreat. Now, I've asked that, I've given that same set of facts from elementary school children all the way up to adults. And I said, would you consider him a suspect? And, you know, I get the same response. Well, why wouldn't you? I go, well, imagine that happened in real life. They said, he had to be considered. I said, well, it happened in my case. And he wasn't considered a suspect. Wasn't he a friend of the police officers? Wasn't he a friend? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, it ended up coming out 
uh, that Jerry Sturman and K. James McCready, who was the lead detective in my case, were friends. This is not me making this up. We had witnesses come forward, testify in post-conviction hearings. Now, what also we came at afterwards is that law enforcement knew about Todd Stroman and his drug dealing, and they never disclosed a lot of it. Subsequent to my conviction, we got access to certain records, which include confidential police reports, where tipsters had called in, called in and said, oh, Todd and Jerry are running a drug dealing business. Maybe you should look into it. That was never disclosed. But in 1990, after a 12-week trial, I was found guilty. Uh, and within days of me being found guilty, all of a sudden some new information started to develop. And we filed post-conviction proceedings, uh, but I wasn't sentenced. So in New York State, they're called CPL 33030 hearings. And those hearings lasted months. Eventually, Judge Alfred Tisch denied all the motions, and I was sentenced to 50 years to life. So imagine being 19 years old, white, Jewish, Long Island, uh, privileged, spoiled. Great looking. <laughs> My wife thinks so. That's what counts. Um, going to prison for 50 years to life. And the strangest things would happen is that you'd get those strange looks going through the system. And I later learned by speaking to some of the correction officers who as strange as it would be, I'm still in contact with some of those correctional officers, that they were troubled seeing me. And it wasn't because they thought I was guilty. It's because they knew I was innocent. And there's nothing they could do about it. And it really was one of the strangest things that I've had to deal with is having contact with these correctional officers after the fact and knowing that they said to me, and they were honest, they said, we kind of look out for you but there was nothing we could really do. Our job was safety, security. You know, we couldn't give you preferential treatment. So here I was, 19 years old, 50 years to life, going upstate saying, shit, what do I do? And, you know, anybody who's young, not educated in the law, would figure out and kind of go, really, what the hell do I do? You know, what, you know, you have this belief that the system doesn't incarcerate innocent people. Now, especially back in 88, 89, 90, when we really didn't have the DNA revolution. Uh, and back then, uh, most reporters didn't really understand the system. They had a utmost reliance and faith in law enforcement and the prosecutor's office. And it really wasn't until we started seeing this DNA revolution that even a lot of people in the press started saying, okay, guess what, we, we may have made a mistake all these years. And I remember uh, in 2004, uh, after my post-conviction proceeding started, I remember asking all the reporters, I go, where were you? And I can't tell you how many of them said, we failed. And I said to them, I said, well, how many of you are going to willing to admit that? Uh, and they're really, and I know I'm jumping around a little bit because I think it's important to understand the press back then is not the press of today. And throughout the 90s, the press changed. And I'm just going to mention one reporter, Carolyn Gussoff. Uh, many of you know her. She was the News 12 reporter who covered my case. Uh, she's transitioned over the years. And she actually wrote a piece where she admitted her faults. Uh, and she was one of the only reporters who covered the case from the very beginning who publicly came out and apologized, uh, admitted her mistakes, and she and I are friends now. Uh, people would say, how could you do that? Uh, she was part of a big picture of the system, but she was like everyone else. You know, you don't convict innocent people individually. Uh, the system is a big machine. Everyone is a little cog in it. So you have to start from the officers that arrest you, the detectives that interrogate you, the technicians that somehow fail to turn the power on the recording devices, um, to the prosecutors who prosecute the case who 
many times may not challenge what's given to them to the judges who are hearing the cases, to the jurors who are hearing the cases, and may not understand every aspect of the case. So here I am in prison, 50 years to life, first appeal, 1993. And if anybody has ever argued a case in the appellate division, it's normally a four-judge panel. And my uncle Mike in California said, what happens if it goes 2-2? And I had Mark Pomerantz, who is one of the most respected, well-known, impeccable former U.S. attorney lawyers, said, ah, come on, it never happens in New York. Never happens. Well, it happened in Marty Tankle's case. And what ended up happening was is a fifth judge was brought on, unbeknownst to anybody, and the court ruled 3-2 against me. So I had two judges who were voting to dismiss the indictments against me in 1993, three voting to affirm. Uh, as you can imagine, some of the affirming judges had some connections or allegiances to Suffolk County. Um, I was granted leave to appeal to the New York State Court of Appeals. They affirmed. I appealed to the District Court. The District Court, court denied relief. I appealed to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. And the Second Circuit Court of Appeals issued a very interesting ruling. One aspect was they said, Mr. Tankleth, your state constitutional rights were absolutely violated. You shouldn't have been arrested. You shouldn't have been found guilty. But we're a federal court. We can only grant federal relief. What they did do, though, is they remanded my case on a Batson hearing, which was a jury selection process. So the Second Circuit remands it back to the district court. The district court remands it back to the state court. And the state court judge's sole responsibility to, was to assess the credibility of the prosecutor of why he excluded certain jurors. And at this hearing, unbeknownst to us, uh, the judge's daughter worked in the DA's office, and her boss was the prosecutor. And after the judge ruled against us, and we disclosed, we uncovered all this, we filed a motion to kind of reopen the hearing and say, okay, there's a little bit of a conflict here because the judge had to assess the credibility of essentially his daughter's boss. Um, so as you can imagine, you know, this was one appeal, another appeal, another appeal. We even took the Second Circuit's decision, went back to the Appellate Division and the New York State Court of Appeals and said, listen, you have the Second Circuit saying the state constitutional rights were violated. You know, you guys have to do something. They did nothing. So finally, my lawyers who were working pro bono, who were primarily from out of state, said what has never been done in my case. And the key thing was an investigation. Suffolk County focused on Marty Tankliff, and that's it. Even though there was Jerry Stewartman and everyone else. So I went on a letter writing campaign and ended up finding a private investigator who said, if you're innocent, hire me. He goes, I will work to get the truth out there. So I said, where do I sign? So J. Sal Peters started working on the case and he did what generally any good investigator does. They follow the money and they follow criminal associates. So he went back to, who else? Jerry Stewart. Jerry Stewart's son, Todd, was a drug dealer who committed violent acts. Todd Stewart had criminal associates. So Jerry, so Jay went out and tracked one of those associates down, Glenn Harris, who said, when Jay finally spoke to him, said, I've been waiting 11 years, 12 years, whatever it was, for this day. And Jay said, what do you mean? He goes, I was the getaway driver that night. So that first meeting kind of opened up Pandora's box where witnesses came forward, identified Joseph Creedon, Peter Kent, Glenn Harris, and a number of other individuals who were involved in my parents' murder. The problem was that in New York State, generally speaking, especially back then, you had to file a 440 hearing to bring these facts out. What we did, though, is that back then we thought the proper way to do it was give the DA's office 45 days to investigate some of the stuff, so 45 days before us filing the hearing, we gave them all the information. They did nothing with it till the 45th day. 
shocking. Uh, we ended up having 18 months of sporadic hearings, and the last witness was Joseph Creedon's son, who said, my father, Joseph Creedon, admitted his involvement in the murders. So we, common sense people, would think that after 20 witnesses had come forward and basically said it was Creedon, Kent, Harris, all these individuals, that I would have gained some relief. Uh, unfortunately, I was denied relief in Suffolk County. We had to appeal to the appellate division. The appellate division granted me relief. I was freed on December 21st, 2007. Within days, the state of New York announced that they were investigating Suffolk County. Uh, within days of that, Suffolk County uh, DA Tom Spoda announced that he was going to dismiss the indictments on a particular date. Uh, unfortunately, for some reason, there was no prosecutors available in the entire office to go to court to actually have the indictments dismissed. So by the time the next court appearance came about, uh, somehow the former illustrious governor, Elliot Spitzer, had appointed a special prosecutor. Um, and what's very interesting about this is that the special prosecutor's office ended up dismissing everything. And then Elliot Spitzer in a Newsweek, I think it was Newsweek, said one of the top thing, 10 things of the year was Marty Tempest getting out. So it really was kind of an odd thing. So in the summer of 2008, all counts were dismissed. Uh, we still had ongoing investigations. I have a federal civil rights lawsuit going. And I really hope that the depositions that were taken because we had an opportunity to question individuals like McCready and Ryan come out. Uh, I actually got to see the men that tried to kill me because I, I tell people, I said, you know, the, the detectives really were the executioners because they did everything they could to incarcerate me. And I, I've come over the last year or two to stop calling what happened to me and my wrongful convictions because there really was nothing wrongful about this. You know, this was intentional. This was preventable. Uh, so why would you call it a wrongful conviction? Were we wrong? Yes. But this really was an intentional conviction. Um, and to be able to sit in the room and look at those detectives while they were on the hot seat, while they were being interrogated by my lawyers, why the truth was being exposed was really one of those moments my wife can tell you was she said you, know, you came home with this kind of swagger and this little smile and I said well I got to kind of say good morning to Dick and McCready because he had to come to the office where I was working so now he was on my turf so it really was one of those moments um, so let me just fast forward a little bit since I've been out. I got my bachelor's degree, a law degree. I married my lovely wife here. Um, I adopted my daughter. Um, but one of the questions that was asked was about a post-exoneration adjustment. Every single day is a challenge. Even to this day, there are little things that are challenging. So for people think that you can kind of really assimilate and reintegrate easily, that woman over there will tell you, I was like a 40-year-old kid at times. You know, some of the early experiences were going to a supermarket. So imagine for 17 years you have access to three types of cereal. That's it. All of a sudden you go to a supermarket, oh my god, there's an entire aisle. <laughs> Okay? Or imagine the only color pair of pants you have are green pants. And you go into a clothing store. You want to see overwhelming overload? That's overload. There were times my wife would drop me off at the supermarket and said, I'll see you in three hours. <laughs> in January of 2008, though, I did probably one of the craziest and smartest things. My family pushed me to go back to college. So here I was maybe three weeks out, and I was going back to college. Now, I already had an associate's degree, but I wanted to get my bachelor's degree. And I remember the first class I took, 
Okay? Pretend this is the classroom and that's the door. I took this seat over here. And that's because I was the goldfish in a sea of sharks. And I wanted that the closest seat to the door so I could run. Because I said to myself, how the F am I going to survive this? I'm twice their age. I've never used computers before. Never sat my ass in a college classroom. But I can tell you, I kept that seat the whole semester. But I started taking my jacket off after a few weeks. I said, I'm going to survive. And I eventually ended up living on campus. Uh, and my wife laughs about it now. Uh, but it really was kind of a necessary thing to kind of relive my youth a little bit. Uh, and a year after I was released, I did something even crazier. I did a semester abroad in Venice. And for me, it really was kind of a defining moment when I was over there because I can remember walking around and I remember walking on somebody's property and not really that it was personal property and here I am halfway across the world and I end up sitting on some bench looking at the war and I go, I'm fucking free. <laughs> and I'm in Venice. And it really was almost like, is this possible? And since then, I don't think I've really turned back much um, because I said, you know what, if I can survive that, I can survive anything. But survival really is more than just existing. Uh, to me, you know, a lot of what Jeff and I do is very similar. We've done advocating. Uh, the most important, one of the most important things I've done, though, is I regularly get called upon by the Innocence Project to testify before the Senate, the Assembly, City Hall about one thing that's very passionate for me is the electronic recording of individual interrogations. And I've said this since 2008. <coughs> Why can't you put it in place? Okay, year after year, other states keep passing legislation where they're getting recordings. How is it New York State, home of the Innocence Project, home of probably, do you know, are we number three in exonerations? Yeah. Number three in exonerations in the country. We can't pass legislation that places like New Orleans have. Long Island Backstory. Chief Correspondent Gary Jacobs is uncovering the truth on Long Island. The family court system. Red light cameras. Corruption in local politics. The heroin epidemic. Corrupt judges. At Long Island Backstory, we uncover the truth that the Cablevision news monopoly won't dare touch. We uncover the details you won't see on News 12 or in Newsday. We are local independent media at its best. Long Island Backstory, available on Public Access TV and on YouTube.